صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا بائب نجاة الأمة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين السلام عليكم جميعا يا شهداء كربلاء ورحمة الله وبركاته أما بعد قال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فلتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد to hasten the reappearance of our 12th and awaited Imam, recite with the loudest of your voices a salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali. Respected brothers and sisters in the community, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Is Muharram an event or is Muharram a symbol? Is Hussein an individual or is Hussein a principle? When analyzing Karbala and analyzing the very message that Abi Abdullah al Hussein came with, we find that Hussein was a man who transcended individuality. And we find that Muharram was an event that transcended time and geographic location. Because today when you analyze the world that we live in today, we find that wherever we look, all we see is Hussein and Yazid. Today you find in the world that we live in today, all we see is oppression against Haq. Thus when we examine Karbala, we come to a logical conclusion that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is not an individual, but he is a principle. And Muharram is not an event. Muharram is what? Muharram is a principle. Because many times when we examine the battle of Karbala, and this word battle tends to limit what Karbala truly is. Because in my opinion, I think Karbala is not a battle. Karbala was this colossal movement that encapsulated the whole world within it. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was not an individual. Imam al Hussein was a man who manifested truth. That if I want to understand what truth is, I go and I dissect the character of Imam al Hussein. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before He created this universe, He created values. He created the value of haqq, for example. He created the value of rahmah. He created the value of karamah, karam, generosity. Allah then chose specific individuals to manifest these qualities and embody them into human beings. So that's when I say Rahmah and I want to understand the infinite mercy of God, I refer back to an individual who already manifested the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why belief in Ahlul Bayt is so necessary. Why? Because if I want to understand the names of Allah, I have to refer back to those who manifested them. That's why Ahlul Bayt السلام, they come forward and they say, Nahnu Asma'ullah. We are the names of Allah. As in, what do you mean you are the names of Allah? Ahlul Bayt are saying, when you want to understand the quality of Rahmah, you go and study the one who was sent as a Rahmah to mankind. 
When you want to understand the quality of karam, al kareem, you go and you analyze the one who manifested generosity and who was known as kareem ahl al bayt. That when I look at someone like Imam al kazim I don't see simply a man by the name of Musa. I see patience walking in front of me. When I study the life of Imam al Hasan al Askari or Imam al Hasan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, I don't simply see a man by the name of Hasan walking. I see generosity walking in front of me. When I analyze Imam al Hussein, I don't see an individual. I see a principle which is labeled sacrifice. Therefore, when we analyze Karbala and we, not, we analyze Imam al Hussein, we see that they transcended individuality and they transcended time, locations. That's why the quote comes and says, Kullu yawmin hashura wa kullu ardin karbala. Every day is Ashura and every land is Karbala in the idea that Karbala isn't only in Iraq, Karbala is here in the United States as well. Hussein didn't only live back when Muharram took place, Hussein lives in every era, in every time, in every place, and in every time. You may say, what does that mean? Because when you ask the question, when did Muharram begin? Usually we'll say, when the caravans left Medina, heading towards Karbala. And when you ask the question, when did Muharram end? We usually say, when Ali ibn al Hussein went back to Karbala and he buried the bodies of the martyred ones. Yet in reality, Muharram didn't begin with the caravans leaving Medina, and Muharram did not end with Ali ibn al Hussein burying the martyred ones in Karbala. Muharram began when Qabil hit Habil. And Muharram will end when Sahib al Zaman comes and takes the banners to revenge for the sacrifice of his grandfather Hussein. Because Muharram, in essence, is haq against batil. The first contact that haq had with batil was with Qabil and Habil. Thus Muharram didn't begin in Karbala. Muharram began when Qabil struck Habil. Now you may say, when does Karbala end? Karbala didn't end with Ali ibn Hussein burying the martyred ones. Karbala will end when the revenger will come and say, Ya li tharat al Hussein. Oh, for the revenge of my grandfather Hussein. Now we see the whole world as Karbala. We see today the revolutions that are taking place in the Arab Spring, for example. We find this is Karbala. When you see injustice taking place in places such as Bahrain, injustice taking place in places such as Palestine, injustice taking place in Iraq, in Pakistan. You know in Pakistan there's an area by the name of Parachinar, Pakistan. The Shia in this area, they go to the Majlis of Hussein not knowing if they're going to come back alive. While we here with the grace of Allah come to the Majlis, we sit, we remember Hussein, we shed our tears for the sacrifice of Karbala, and we know for a fact we're going to go back home safely. This is a rahmah. This is a blessing. Sometimes we take our events for granted. Sometimes we take the majalis of Hussein for granted. Sometimes we take this very mimbar for granted. This mimbar is the mouth of Hussein. This mimbar is what represents the message of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Were it not for this pulpit, then tell me. Why is it? How will the world know who Imam al-Hussein is? That's why you find Muawiyah and the likes of Muawiyah tried so hard with all their power, with all their strength to corrupt this member by beginning with the curse of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know, for 200 years, they would begin Salat al-Jum'ah, they would begin all of their sermons. The first thing they would do is curse Ali ibn Abi Talib. They would say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, oh Allah curse Ali, and they would begin. Imagine. You may say, why would they do such a thing? Because they were trying to infiltrate through the system of the member. They were trying to infiltrate and inject their own two cents worth within the majlis. So that whenever you hear majlis Hussein, you remember cursing Ali ibn Talib. Yet until today, you find the member is stronger than ever. You go today, see while I'm speaking here about Imam al-Hussein, millions of people are remembering Imam al-Hussein all around the world. This shows it's a universal message. This shows it's a message that every human being can relate to. Yet in tonight's examination, we will ask the simple question, how can we bring Karbala to life? Because Karbala revitalized mankind.
Imam al Hussein revitalized mankind. Yet today we need to revitalize Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein sacrificed himself for the very reason to bring life to the Ummah. The Ummah was dead. The Ummah's heart was cold as a as an iceberg. It was cold. It was dead. I mean, to have the very audacity to sit on the chest of Imam al Hussein and to look into the eyes of the grandson of the Holy Prophet and behead him, this shows that they had hearts of coal. That when you go back to Karbala and you see the dialogue that Shimr had with Hussein, it's one of the most heart wrenching dialogues you'll ever come across. While Imam al Hussein was on the sands of Karbala, Shimr was sitting upon that holy chest. He tells him, Hussein asks Shimr, may Allah curse him. He tells him, Ya Shimr, Ala ta'rifuni? He tells him, Ya Shimr, do you not know who I am? He tells him, Naam a'rifuk. Until Hussein, Ibn Ali, Ibn Fatima. He says, no doubt I know you. You are Hussein, son of Fatima, daughter of Muhammad. He asks him a very crucial question. He tells him, if you know me, why do you want to kill me? As in, if you know I am Hussein, son of Fatima, daughter of Muhammad, why do you want to kill me? Listen to the reply and you'll understand how cold of a heart Shimmer had. Even furthermore, listen to the reply and you'll come to a conclusion why Shia are being killed in the world today. Shimmer replies to him. He tells him, Bughdan min abika Ali. Because of the envy and hatred that I have toward your father, Ali. Today you go to places such as Bahrain. Today you go to places such as Pakistan. And you ask them, why are you killing the followers of Ali? Because we envy Ali. You may say, what does that mean? Envy Ali. Ali died 1400 years ago. How could this envy still be alive until today? Because Ali ibn Abi Talib's love cannot coincide with Batil. When you love Ali, it's impossible to love Batil. And when you hate Ali, it's impossible to love Haq. Why? Because Ali is with Haq. Well, Haq is with Ali. Ali is with truth. And truth is with Ali. Now today in the world, the world today, وَأَكْثَرُهُمْ لِلْحَقِّ كَارِهُونَ and the majority of the people in the world today hate Haq. If Haq is Ali, then it's impossible for the world to love Ali. Thus, since we have this love of Ali inside our hearts, people want to kill it because this love is what represents Haq. That's why they say there was once a man in the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib, in the time of his leadership, who was caught stealing. He came to Ali ibn Abi Talib and he was accused and trialed and it was confirmed that he's a man who stole. Ali was following the Sharia, and Sharia says that if a stealer comes in an Islamic government, then it's obligatory to cut the tip of his fingers. They say that he cut the tip of his fingers, and he went back. The enemies of Ali ibn Abi Talib came to him, and they wanted to instigate him, as in they wanted to tell him, listen, it's impossible for you to love Ali now, since he, he was the very one to, who cut your fingers. They wanted to say, listen, how could you love Ali and he's the very man who cut your fingers? Notice that if you were cut into pieces and you love Ali ibn Abi Talib, this love cannot go away. And if you are a hypocrite and you want to love Ali, it would be impossible. That's why Rasulullah says, Ya Ali, حبك إيمان وبغضك كفر وعصيان Ya Ali, your love is Iman and hating you is true disbelief and disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they come to this man, they tell him, how could you still love Ali ibn Abi Talib? He said, Ali cut my fingers because I was against Batil, and Ali is with Haq, and it's impossible for Ali and Batil to coincide. That when I love Ali ibn Abi Talib, when I love Imam al-Hussein, I can't love wrong. That's why I get surprised that when you find our youth in today's day and age, with the same breath that says Assalamu alaikum ya Abu Abdullah is the same breath that's cursing. The same breath that's listening to music. The same eye that looks at the Quran and looks at the verses of Allah is the same eye that's looking at haram pictures once they leave the majlis. The same breath that says Ya Hussein. What does Ya Hussein mean? 
When you say Ya Hussein, you're making an oath with Aba Abdullah Al Hussein. You're making an ahid. You're paying your allegiance to Hussein, telling him Ya Hussein, you were on haq and I'm going to strive to do the same exact thing you did. That in our salah, when we say Ihdina Sirat Al Mustaqim, guide us to the straight path. How are we supposed to be guided to the straight path? If the minute we finish salah, we're backbiting or listening to music, that salah is an oath with Allah. I tell him, Ya Allah, this is for you. Ya Allah, this salah, I'm building a relationship with you. Ya Allah, bear witness that I just asked you to put me on the path of mustaqim. I'm going to finish salah and go look for this path of mustaqim. That if you ever want to know if your salah was accepted, analyze what you do after salah. I'm sure many of you sometimes you ask yourself, how do I know if my salah is accepted? How do I know if Allah has accepted the salah? Ahlul Bayt say, once you finish salah, you analyze your character after salah. If you do haram, then know that your salah was accepted because you just made an oath with Allah. That's why you find one day one of our greatest ulama was approached after he finished salah. Because one of his students was sitting on the side and he was looking at him praying. He seen that this halim was praying kind of quickly. Because you know sometimes we have this idea of our ulama, they have to, his ruku' has to be half an hour. His sujood has to be maybe, you know, 20 minutes. He has to have this long white beard, maybe somewhere in Japan, you know, nice and silky. We have this idea, this, this um, you know, this mystic image of our ulama. So he's looking at this alim and he's praying very quickly. He says, this is awkward. So he goes to him, he says, Mawlana, taqabbar Allah amalkum, inshallah. He says, thank you. He says, I have a quick question. He said, I noticed that your salah was kind of quickly. You know, at the end we see our ulama very nice and slow. He told him, listen to the reply, brothers and sisters. He tells him, it doesn't matter how fast I pray. He said, what do you mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, jabbar al-sama. He told him, let me tell you that salah begins once it ends. Listen to the words. He says, let me tell you that salah begins once it ends. What was he trying to say? He's saying that salah is an oath. What's important is what I do after salah. As in you don't know a human being while salah. You know a human being after he finishes salah. You don't know a human being during Muharram. You know a human being after Muharram. Because Muharram is just the charger. You know when you have a, for example, this phone right here. I'm not marketing my phone. But you see you have a phone right here. And you have a charger. You take the charger and you put it into the plug. Eventually you're going to have to disconnect the charger. Correct or no? I mean, can you keep a charger in the phone for five days? You can't. Eventually you need the phone. You have to leave. Muharram is the charger. Eventually you're going to disconnect yourself from Muharram. And this is when the truth test comes, where you say, did I learn from Muharram? Did I charge this dead battery or is the battery still dead? Because sometimes we finish Muharram and we cry, no doubt. And we love Hussein, yet Muharram finishes and that's it, that's when Hussein finishes. As in Hussein died just so we can remember him for 10 days, right? Imam Ali died just so that we can remember him for three days. The 21st, 22nd, 23rd, that's it. 19th, 20th, and 21st, huh? No, Hussein died to spark something to keep it going. Now the question comes, how can we bring Imam Hussein to life? There are three dimensions which we have to look at Karbala from so that we can bring Karbala to life. Number one is Karbala in the past. Number two is Karbala in the present. And number three is Karbala in the future. There are three dimensions where we have to analyze the battle of Karbala. Because sometimes we just look at Karbala from one of these phases, only in the past. And we don't connect it to the present. And sometimes we connect it to the present, but we don't connect it to the future. What does this mean? The human being is only able to come to life He's only able to know his true potential when he looks at himself from these three dimensions. Where he came from, where he is, and where he's going. Was it not Ali ibn Abi Talib himself who came and said, Rahimallahum ra'in, arifa min ain, wa fi ain, 
وإلى أين. He says, may Allah have mercy on the one who knows where he came from, where he is, and where he's going. You know, 3D, you know, 3D picture. Sometimes we go to the movies and we watch a movie in 3D. When you look at the 2D, it's nice, but it doesn't look as alive when you look at something from 3D. You can see it, the size, you can see the dimensions of it. You can, it's almost as if you're living the movie. We have to look at ourselves in 3D dimension. Where was I? Where am I? And where am I going? Because as human beings, we learn from the past to perfect our present and prepare for the future. Let me repeat that one. As human beings, we learn from the past to perfect our present and prepare for the future. Many of us just live in the now. Many of us. Many of us just live right now. What's gonna happen tomorrow? I can care less. What am I gonna eat right now? What am I gonna watch right now? Who am I gonna go and see right now? Which movie am I gonna go watch right now? Which restaurant am I gonna go with my friends right now? What's going to happen tomorrow, I can care less. And then you have another one who just lives in the past. If he committed a sin, if he did something haram, his past is overshadowing his mind. He can't think clearly. A human being who wants to come alive and become 3D has to look at his past, his present, and his future. Now, what is the past? The past within the Holy Quran has been mentioned on a number of occasions. Allah, for example, in one verse says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الْإِنسَانْ أَنَّا خَلَقْنَاهُ مِنْ نُطْفَةِ فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمٌ مُّبِينٌ Allah within the Quran is constantly emphasizing on our past. Where did we come from? From where did we originate? Do you know why? Because once you know where you came from, it's impossible for you not to live a life of humility. Because many people are arrogant, self-conceited, they see nothing in life except themselves. Why? Because they forget their past. They forget from what they were created. Because sometimes the human being can be so materialistic, he reaches the highest levels of life and education and degree that he forgets that he came from a small mingled drop of sperm. The commander of the faithful puts it so eloquently that it brings tears to the hardest of hearts. He says, I'm surprised at the human being. He came past. He came from a drop of semen. He walks with feces in his stomach. He had no control on when he came. And he has no control on when he leaves. Yet he walks around like he knows everything. It's sad, brothers and sisters. Very sad. Sometimes you sit down, you think about it. SubhanAllah. I mean, yes, the people love me. Yes, the people are always talking to you. Yes, I may have so much money. I may have the best of cars. Yeah, where did I come from? Other than this philosophy, what is it that kept Ali ibn Abi Talib humble? Why? Because he knows who he is. Allah says, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا he says, and the servants of Allah are those who walk humbly on this earth. And when the ignorant come and speak to them, they say peace. They walk humbly. Allah says, Luqman says to his son, He says, do not walk with your, with your cheek turning away from the people. Sometimes you find people walking around with his chest up. As if his dad owns the universe. Allah says, walk humbly. Understand your past. Within the Quran, Allah is always emphasizing on our past, on our origin, so that we can maintain our humility. Number one. Number two, a, the second element of our past is known as culture. Because one of the most important elements within the human being is his culture. Now, if I was to come to you right now, for example, and tell you who are you, for many of us, the first thing that we're going to define ourselves by is our culture. For example, who are you? Oh, well, I'm from this tribe. I'm from this culture. I'm from this city. 
Culture is very ex extremely important in the lives of every single human being. Yet culture can become a stimulant and culture can become a stagnant. What do I mean by this? Culture can become something that gives you stimulation because the past is of two types. Past that stimulates you and past that makes you stagnant. When we look at the message of Imam al Hussein simply as something in the past, it becomes a, f a form of stagnation. It becomes something that limits us because we will shed our tears for Imam al Hussein. We will hit our chest for Imam al Hussein. We will curse the shimmer of Imam al Hussein. Yet when it comes to cursing the shimmer of today, nobody curses him. Was it not Shaheed Mutahari? May Allah bless his soul. Shaheed Mutahari, rahmatullahi alayhi, has one of the most fascinating lines I have ever come across. He says, Imam Hussein did not die once. Please listen to these lines. He says, Imam al Hussein did not die once. Imam Hussein died twice. He told him, What do you mean? He said, Once in Karbala and the second time on the pulpits of the Shia. He told him, How could you say such a thing? People were angry. He told him, What do you mean on the pulpits of the Shia? He said, Once he died in Karbala physically. Yet ideologically, Hussein has been killed on the pulpits. They told him why. He said, because when we limit Hussein to simply as a past, we look back and we say, Ya Laytana. You see, every majlis, what do we begin with? Ya Laytana, kunna ma'akum sadati. You know, always we begin, Oh, how we wish we were with you, oh, our masters. Why do we wish we were with you? So that we can do the same thing you did. So that, Ya Aba Abdullah, if I was there on the 10th of Muharram and I seen Umar ibn Sa'ad and Yazid ibn Awiyah going against you, going against justice, then I would fight them. When I say, Ya Laytana kunna ma'akum, I'm saying that I need to bring the past into the present. Meaning what? I was there cursing Shimr. Today I need to go and search for the Shimr of today. It's extremely unfortunate, brothers and sisters. We find majority of people are professionals at cursing Yazid. But how about the Yazid of today? How about the Yazid of today? Are we not supposed to be going against him? I mean, how could you speak out against the injustice of Shimmer and not speak out against the injustice of the Shimmer of today? Because in every area you'll find a Hussein and in every area you'll find a Yazid. That's why you find when Saddam, the dictator of Iraq, for 35 years, when he was killing Shahid al-Sadr al-Awwal, he made it very clear of who he was taking as a role model. Look at how Saddam took somebody in the past as his role model, and he was following the same footsteps, and he knew that there was a Hussein and Yazid in every time. When Saddam was killing and torturing Shahid al-Sadr al-Awwal, Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, that great philosopher, they came to him and they told him, Saddam, we understand that you're killing Shahid al-Sadr, but why are you killing his sister bint al-Huda? As in, what does she have to do with the message? Kill Shahid al-Sadr and keep bint al-Huda on the side, let her go back safely to her home. Listen to what he said. He said, I don't want to make the same mistake that Yazid did. I don't want to make the same mistake as Yazid. They told him, what do you mean? He said, Yazid was a very dumb man. Yazid killed Hussein, but he didn't kill the one that was going to carry on the message of Hussein. Hussein was killed, yet it was Zainab who carried on the message of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Saddam came and said, I don't want to make the same mistake. I'm going to kill the Hussein of the time. And I'm going to kill the Zainab of the time. Because a Hussein is always going to be present. And the Zainab is always going to be present as well. Thus for me to limit the message of Islam, I have to kill the both of them. Why did he say that? Because he understood what the past was doing. He understood the mistake of Yazid. He was looking into the past and he learned from it. Today, what do you find? Today you find many of us don't incorporate the past in our life. So you find the second form of past is culture. Let me explain this very quickly. Culture can be used as a stimulant and it can be a form of stagnation. Because culture can be used as a barrier and culture can be used as a bridge. 
You may say, how can it be used as a bridge? Cultures are beautiful. Sometimes you find excellent cultures. For example, you find Dhul Qarnayn. One day he was walking. And Dhul Qarnayn was known for traveling. So one day Dhul Qarnayn was passing by an area and he seen many graves and a cemetery. He said, let me enter this cemetery and see exactly what's going on. Dhul Qarnayn goes into this area and he sees that on these graves are written very low numbers. He goes to the first grave, he sees six. He goes to the second grave, he sees five. He goes to the third grave, he sees eight. He says, is this a graveyard for the young people or people do just, are people just die young here in this place? So he goes to the leaders of the community. Notice how culture can be a form of beautiful expression. Culture can bring some beautiful things. They go to the time and he tells them, he goes to the people and he tells them, excuse me, your graves are written very low numbers. Is it simply because your people die at young ages or is this just a graveyard for the young people? He told him no. So what do you mean? He said, we don't write down on this grave how many years this person lived for. So what do you write? He said, we write down how many years this person truly worshiped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He told him, what do you mean? Very true. Because sometimes you find person who is 80 years old, 90 years old, yet when you want to boil down his life to how many productive years he's had, very limited, two, three years. That culture was able to teach the Qarnayn a lesson where they told him we don't write down how many years this person lived for, we write down how many years he truly worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because sometimes a person can be 80 and in comparison to a, for example, the five-year-old who memorized the whole Quran, there's no comparison that the value of a human being is not evaluated by the age of his existence, but by how many years were actually productive. So you find that in one area, culture was able to see as a bridge. But in other areas, culture is a form of stagnation. Sometimes culture can prevent us from reaching the highest limits of our potential. You may say, what do you mean? Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is a cure. Imam al Hussein is a cure. He's a melody. Yet, if Imam al Hussein is misunderstood, he becomes an ailment. And these were beautifully expressed by the words of Ali ibn Abi Talib himself, where he came and said, Halaka fiya ithnan, muhibbun ghal. He says, two people will be destroyed because of me. One who exaggerates and one who understates. If you exaggerate in their status, then you find you're going to set Imam Hussein as an ailment in society. Why? Because now we can say Hussein did this, Hussein did that, and we're minimizing him from his true character. Let me say, what does that mean? Ahlul Bayt are stars. Allah says in the Quran, فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِعُ النُّجُومِ وَإِنَّهُ قَسَمٌ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ He says, I swear by the position of the stars. Rasulullah comes and explains what these stars actually are. He says, النُّجُومُ أَمَانٌ لِأَهْلِ السَّمَاءِ وَأَهْلُ بَيْتِ أَمَانٌ لِأَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ he says, the stars are a source of safety for the people of the sky. And my family members are a source of safety for the people of the earth. He's saying that the stars sweared by within the Holy Quran represent Ahlul Bayt. Now, if Ahlul Bayt are stars, if you were, for example, to go and destroy a star or take the star out of his position, what is this going to do? It's going to create an imbalance in the galaxies. Ahlul Bayt are the same exact thing. They are stars and they have been placed in specific positions by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you remove them from their position, if you put them at a higher status or a lower status, then there will be imbalance in the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here you find culture in a way could allow us to limit the potential of Hussein and to tarnish the true image of Abu Abdullah al Hussein that our past can be used both as a progression and as a form of stagnation. And then comes our present. Our present is where our past and our future mixes together. You may say, what does that mean? Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad.
علي بن أبي طالب وزمان who was constantly mixing the past, the present, and the future in everything that he did. On the night of Khandaq, when Ali ibn Abi Talib was fighting the enemy of Allah, and he struck him, where the hadith comes and says, ضَرْبَةُ عَلِي نِيُومَ الْخَنْدَقِ تَعْدُ الْعِبَادَةِ الثَّقَلَيْنِ The strike of Ali on the day of Khandaq is equivalent to the worship of jinn and ins put together. Ali ibn Abi Talib in that one hit was able to incorporate the past, the present, and the future. As for the past, Ali ibn Abi Talib was revenging for all of the prophets that came before him. As for the present, Ali was doing saving the religion of Islam from being wiped off the earth. And as for the future, is a very interesting one. Because a hadith come and tell us that when Ali ibn Abi Talib would ever kill somebody, he would look seven generations into his lineage if he found one person who was a mu'min he wouldn't kill him that's why in the battle of Safin, when ali and malik were going towards the battlefield because as you know ali ibn abi talib had such a relationship with malik al-ashtar that he says malik was to me like i was to rasulullah imagine the relationship he says malik was to me imagine how close was ali to rasulullah he says Ali Malik was to me like I was to Rasulullah. Ali ibn Abi Talib would do a dual combo when they would go to the battlefield of Safin. It's as if Malik would turn his back and Ali would turn his back and their backs would be against each other and they would go towards the battlefield. So Malik, while they're fighting, there is a conversation that goes placed between Malik and Ali. Malik tells him, Ya Ali, I killed the same number of people as you. He tells him, you may have. How do you know? He said, because whenever you killed somebody, you said, Allahu Akbar, and I counted how many times you said, Allahu Akbar. He said, that's true, but there's a difference between the people I kill and between the people you kill. He said, when you kill somebody, you simply wipe him off this earth, and you don't know who he is, and where he came from, and where he's going. Yet, when I kill somebody, I look seven generations into his lineage. If I find one person who was a follower of Islam, I wouldn't kill him. You see, he took the future into perspective. That Ali ibn Abi Talib on that hit of Khandaq and he was killing that enemy of Allah. He took the past into consideration because he was revenging for the prophets. He took the present into consideration because he was saving the religion of Islam at that time. And he took the future into consideration because Ali does not kill anyone except if he looks seven generations to his lineage. And if there is one person who is a mu'min, he wouldn't kill him. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now you have instances where the past comes into the future. You say, what do you mean? You find Fatima Zahra alayhi salam when she was being conceived by Khadija. Khadija alayhi salam asked the ladies of Quraysh for help. And as you know, Quraysh wasn't so friendly with Rasulullah. They said, since you are the wife of Rasulullah, we're not going to come and help you. Khadija alayhi salam asked Allah for help. She looked to the sky, she said, Ya Allah, help me. Khadija alayhi salam narrates that I seen four ladies walk into the room. The first one said, I am Um Kulthum, the sister of Musa. The second one said, I am Asya, the wife of Fir'aun. The third one said, I am Maryam, the, 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 who, the mother of Isa. And the fourth one said that we are all here to help you. Four ladies walked in, coming from the past to help the present. Why? Because when something is so important, it transcends time. When you find something important, it transcends time. That's why even today when you're so, when you're so focused on something that you're doing, you forget time. Time begins to pass. That's why when we speak to Sahib al-Zaman, what do we refer to him as? We say, As-salamu alayka ya Sahib al-Zaman. What does that mean? As in many times we say it. But what does Sahib al-Zaman actually mean? We say, peace be upon you, O master of time. Meaning what? Meaning time is a tool for Sahib al-Zaman. Because when something has importance, when something is so, so, so crucial in the eyes of Allah, it begins to tra transcend the realms of time. That you find in the instance of Fatima, the past came into the present. Now you find sometimes 
the present goes into the past. Ali ibn Abi Talib has a narration where he says, Kuntu ma'al anbiya'i batina. Wa ma'a ibn ammi Muhammad zahira. He says, I was with the prophets hidden. And I am with my Prophet Muhammad apparent. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib in these words is making clear a very crucial and important element. He says, Kuntum al batina. I was with the prophets hidden. Meaning when Musa was there, Ali was there as well. It's a very scary hadith if you look at it. When Isa was there, I was with him. When Nuh was there, I was with him. He says, Kuntum al batina. I was with the prophets hidden. Yet with my Prophet Muhammad, I am their apparent. Because when something is important, it transcends the element of time. That's why the present has to be a mixture. This is the main point I'm trying to send. The present has to be a mixture between the past and the future. I know where I came from. Where I am. What am I doing in life? The days are running. Life is going by. People are dying. Countries are being overthrown. I tell you, brothers and sisters, the events that are taking place in the world today are unfolding in front of our eyes and things are happening that weren't able to happen within 500 years. Things that weren't open, able to happen 500 years are unfolding within our eyes within a few months. Time is going fast. I mean, do you remember how many years ago you were just a little child going to school? I mean, when you sit down and think about it, it felt as if it was yesterday. Just the other day, I was still a baby in my house. I wasn't married. I was still going to high school. Of course, I'm still a baby, you know. I'm still going to high school, and I'm still, but I'm speaking to the older generation. Think about it. Just a few years ago, you were a child with your parents. You were going to school. You were studying. You were depending on your parents for food. And now we are grown men, owning businesses, owning houses, having our children. And those who are children today, tomorrow will see themselves as parents of children. Time is going by very quickly, brothers and sisters. Only the wise can sit down and say, listen, time, if I don't conquer it, it will conquer me. We have an Arabic proverb that goes forward and says, الوقتك السيف إن لم تقطعه يقطعك Time is like a sword. If you don't cut it, it will cut you. Time is a tool. Allah swears by time. He says, well, عصر. time is going by very quickly, brothers and sisters. Today we're here sitting down. In a few years, you'll see yourself somewhere else. And you'll see these years as little moments, little seconds going by quickly. As for our youth, we have to sit down and come to a conclusion. Today, you say, today I'm going to set a vision for my life. Today I'm going to be a better person. Today I'm going to ask myself, am I doing the important thing in life? What's my purpose in life? What am I doing? Have I done something for the community? Have I come up here, for example, and given a, a speech or a workshop or a presentation or even recited the nawha? We have to encourage our youth to do things like that. Because if the community doesn't, then no one is going to, brothers and sisters. We have to see vision within our hope. We have to see hope within our youth as well. We have to be able to encourage them to do these kinds of things because time is going by quickly and we have to conquer it before it conquers us. And then comes the element of future. And I would like to conclude with this. The future has been stressed so importantly in the Quran on a number of accounts. For example, death. Allah says, فَلْتَنْظُرْ نَفْسٌ مَا قَدَّمَتْ لغد. Let the soul look what has it offered for tomorrow. By the way, there's going to be a day where you're going to be standing in front of Allah and He's going to ask you for the small and big that you have done. فَلْتَنْظُرْ نَفْسٌ مَا قَدَّمَتْ لغد. You find Sulaiman alayhi salam one day was sitting in his palace. Nabi Allah Sulaiman was known for the wealth that he had. He had wealth, like crazy. He had castles. He had jinns building his castles, according to the Holy Quran. That one day, Sulaiman is standing 
and he's looking at his castle being built by the jinns. Suleiman narrates that he's seen a man come in and he asked him, excuse me, who are you? Suleiman asks him, who are you? Where have you come from? What are you doing here? He said, I have come to take your soul. I am Nabiullah Suleiman. Knock on the door. Tell me salamu alaikum. Send me a text message. Send me a notification. Send me a message on Facebook. Tell me when you're going to come. He tells him no. When the time of death comes, it's time for death. When it's time to go, it's time to go. He tells him, Khob, no problem. Let me go from the sunlight into the shade. He told him, when it's time to go, it's time to go. He said, no problem. Let me go and visit my family. Let me go and tell them, Ma'asalamu khuda hafiz. I'm going. Fima Allah. Assalamu alaikum. He says, no. When it's time to go, it's time to go. He tells him, let me just go and drink some water. My mouth is dry. He tells him, no. It's time to go. He tells him, Khob, why didn't you send me a notification? Why didn't you send me a message telling me that it's time to go? He tells him, Sulaiman, Allah sent you plenty of messages. Said, what do you mean? He said, don't you remember that man who died a few weeks ago? He says, yes. He says, that was, your, that was message number one. He told him, don't you remember the person who just died a few days ago? He told him, yes. He told him that was message number two. He told him, didn't you hear of your relative who just died a few moments ago? He said, yes. He said, that was message number three. He tells him, Sulaiman, I have been sending you message after message, that yet you have been oblivion of them. How many times have you come and attended Majlis Aza or funeral for somebody and you look at that casket and you go back home thinking as if it was just a cultural gathering? Sulaiman learned a lesson. He said, whenever I go into a gathering, whenever I go into a funeral, I see that casket as me laying inside there. Because there will come a moment where you will be in that casket and others will be sitting on top of it crying about you. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ دَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Every soul shall taste death. That when I take death into perspective, I am enhancing my vision of the future. When death is always on my mind, this material means nothing anymore. This phone means nothing anymore. My house means nothing anymore. My $600 watch means nothing anymore. My business means nothing anymore. Ali ibn Abi Talib was one of the few men who had the ability to put sand in one hand, gold in another, and not see the difference between the two. Ali ibn Abi Talib, they would come to him. They would put gold in one hand and sand in another. He would tell them, Ya Bayda, Ya Safra, Ghurri, Ghayri. O silver, O white, referring to silver and gold. Deceive other than Ali. For I have divorced this world three times. I have divorced you three times. I'm done with you. When death is always on my mind, everything becomes clear. I see you as a human being. This envy, how many brothers and sisters in our community are envious of each other? How many brothers and sisters in our communities have this haqid, this hasad? They see somebody successful, they can't handle it. They see somebody having something they don't have, it just burns inside of them, it eats up their heart, they can't handle it. That when death becomes something clear, I begin to take the future into prospect and that's why when it comes to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam's message you find likewise it had three phases the past the present and the future as for the past Karbala was a tear as for the present Karbala was blood and as for the future Karbala was a smile as for the tear, Karbala was initially tears in the eyes of the prophets that came before Karbala. Because did you know that every prophet cried about Karbala? Nabiullah Nuh shed his tears for Karbala. Ruayat say that his name was Nuh. Nuh. لِكُثْرَةِ نَوْحِهِ عَلَى الْحُسَيْنِ Because of how much, how much he did Nuh for Imam Al-Husayn alayhi salam. Ibrahim was one day walking, passing by Naynawa. And he trips over a stone and he begins to bleed. He turns up, he tells him, Khuda, Allah, have I done anything wrong? I am your friend. I am Khalilullah. 
He tells him, no, Ibrahim, you haven't done anything wrong. Yet the very place where you fell is where your grandson Hussein is going to be killed. And I wanted your blood to be mixed with his. Adam alayhi salam cries for Karbala. They say Adam alayhi salam was once in paradise where the verse comes and says, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمِ الْأَسْمَاءِ And he taught Adam the names. Some ahadith come and say that the names were five. The first name was Muhammad. The second name was Ali. The third name was Fatima. The fourth was Hassan. And the fifth was Hussein. He told him, Ya Allah, whenever you say Muhammad, I feel happiness inside of me. Whenever you say Ali, I feel happiness inside of me. Whenever you say Fatima, I feel happiness inside of me. Whenever you say Hassan, I feel tranquility inside of me. Yet that fifth name brings tears to my eyes. That fifth name brings sadness into my heart. He told him, Naam ya Adam, because this Hussein is the man that all prophets are crying about. They say there was a Nabi by the name of Ismail ibn Hizqil. This Ismail was tortured to such an extent in his time that they say they ripped the very skin off his face. They say while Bani Israel was torturing him, Jibra'il was descended by Allah. He said, Jibra'il, go and ask him if he needs any help from me. Jibra'il goes to him. He tells him, Ya Ismail, Allah sends me to you. He says, if you need anything from him. He tells him, no, from you I don't need anything. He told him, why? He told him, all I want is one thing. I want you to resurrect me on the day where Hussein is resurrected so that I can fight with him. He told him, what do you mean? He told him, Li uswatun bil Hussein ibn Ali. He said, I have an example in Hussein, son of Ali. He said, Hussein was tortured, is going to be tortured to such an extent. There's no comparison between him and the skin that's being ripped off my face. Let me take him as an example. This is before Hussein came into existence. Yet Hussein was a tear in the eyes of the prophets. And then Hussein became blood. Karbala, number one, was a tear. Number two, it was blood. Where it actualized into physical contact. It became serious. Hussein was killed. His blood was shed. Now the dream of the prophets was actualized. It became something real in front of their eyes and then Hussein was a smile three stages a tear blood and a smile this smile represents Imam Sahib al-Zaman because yes we cry about Imam Mahdi but we should use these tears we cry about Hussein but we should use these tears as fuel of motivation to prepare it for Sahib al-Zaman as in these tears could fall, but if they are not put into three prospects, past, present, and future, we simply see them as emotional tears. We need not crocodile tears. We need tears that serve as fuel and gasoline to keep us going, preparation for Imam Sahib al-Zaman. That's why you find prophets would cry about Hussein. Zakaria alayhi salam once asked Allah. He told him, Ya Allah, what is this kaf ha ya ayn sad represent? Because Zakaria had a son by the name of Yahya. Yahya was so relevant and similar to Imam al Hussein that you find Yahya had this only name. The only person who was named Yahya was Yahya. And the only person who was firstly named Hussein was Hussein. Yahya and Hussein were very similar. So Zakaria asked Allah, He told him, Ya Allah, what does this kaf ha ya ayn sad represent? He told him, فَأَمَّا الْكَافْ فَهِيَ كَرْبَلَاء He told him, as for kaf, it represents Karbala. He told him, فَأَمَّا الْهَا It represents هَلَاكَ الْعِتْرَةِ الطَّاهِرَةِ He told him, as for the ha, it represents the tragedies and tribulations that will befall Al-Muhammad. He told him, as for the ya, it represents Yazid ibn Muawiyah, the oppressor of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. He told him, فَأَمَّا الصَّاعِدْ فَهِيَ صَبْرُ الْحُسَيْنَ عَلَى الْأَذَى he told him, فَأَمَّا الصَّعَدْ It is the sabr, the patience of Aba Abdullah in Karbala. He told him, Ya Allah, 
pray that Imam Al Hussein will choose me as one of his soldiers. Yet you find, brothers and sisters, that Karbala is going to end as a smile because the blood of Hussein is going to be fuel for the revolution of Sahib al Zaman. And that's why you find when Sahib al Zaman, may Allah hasten his reappearance, is going to come, he's going to go to Mecca and then he's going to go to Karbala saying, La ya li al Hussein. Oh, for the revenge of Hussein, I have come. One of our ulama says that I was sleeping and Sahib al Zaman came to me in my dream. He told me, the scholar says, I asked Sahib al Zaman, Oh, Imam, why is it in Ziarat Nahya? You say, La andubannaka sabahan wa masa. ولا أبكي أن عليك بدل الدموع دما. He told him, Oh, صاحب الزمان, in the ziyara you say that I am going to mourn your death day and night. And besides crying about your tragedy tears, I'm going to shed fresh blood for your tragedy. He told him, Oh, صاحب الزمان, who are you referring to in the ziyara? He told him, Are you referring to the death of Hussein? He told him, لا والله, I am not referring to Hussein. He told him, are you referring to the tragedies of Al Abbas? He told him, no, not for the tragedies of Abu Fadl. He told him, are you referring to the tragedies of Al Akbar? The tragedies of Al Qasim? The tragedies of Sukaina? He told him, no, none of these was I referring to. If they were present, they would cry upon this tragedy as well. He told him, ya Imam, what tragedy were you referring to? in the ziyarat he says he says I cry upon the tragedy of my aunt Zainab Allahu Akbar what happened in Karbala to Zainab alayhi salam yet the patience that she had was unmatched in the course of history you find that Zainab alayhi salam was passing by the bodies of Abu Abdullah heading toward Shawam. She wanted to run to the body of her brother Hussein. Yet Zain al Abidin told her, Amma Zainab, Rahami, Zafa Badani. Amma Zainab, I want you to have mercy on my weak body. Wallah, I can't. Can't handle seeing you crying about Imam Al Hussein. He tells you, "I'm a Zainab, and I'm a Khaki bin Ala Zahir Naqay." He tells you, "Oh, and Zainab, farewell, Hussein, from upon the camel." Zainab shouts with these famous lines of poetry. We refer to her saying, "Wadatak Allah ya Ayuni." يا بيردون عنك يفارقوني يا بوزاجري وخالي يالي باروني نخات اخوتي ولا جاوبوني Narration say that when Zainab was passing by the bodies of Hussein heading towards the land of Al-Sham they say that she saw an old man crying upon his body. Zainab says, Oh, old man, who are you? She tell, he replies to her, Zainab, you didn't recognize your grandfather, Rasulullah. Rasulullah was there crying on the body of Abu Abdullah, repeating these salutations to that beheaded body, telling him, Sallallahu alayhi Ya Abba Abdullah. A Turjum Matun, Katalat Hussein, Shafa, Ata Jedihi, O Melhisab. Ya Allah. Allah, who is Eluka Behakal Hussein, is Shaheed, Finkar Bala, Allah, who is Eluka Behatashil Hussein, Gharib, Al Huraba, Allah, who is Ajil Walik, Al Faraj. 
واجعلنا من الصالح واتباعه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم ثبت قلبنا على دينك ما حييتنا ولا تزغ قلوبنا بعد اذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة انك انت الوهاب Brothers and sisters, we have a few brothers who are sick. One of the brothers is brother 